with you guys in the AO community. I am waiting to make sure everything's looking good here. I'm going to start with a little background. Okay, looks like we're good to go. Uh, okay, hi again, everybody. It's Greg D'Amico. I have a software company called Efficient and been doing mentorship here with AO for a little while. Oh, I don't know, for over a year, I guess now. And excited to be back. I was out last month. Sorry to miss you guys, but I lost my mother. And was uh, it's a tough one, and, and she was in a lot of pain and, and a lot of suffering. So she's peaceful now, and I am uh, trying to be content with that, but still a big emotional loss. So I do my little bit background. I started out and had an investment firm back in the early, um, early 90s and, and I in the, into the 2000s. I had a mutual fund, rode the wave up in the late 90s, rode it back down again, and then I started a software company. In 2004, I went to India, set up my own office, and been doing custom software applications. Right now, we do a lot of mobile and e-commerce and uh, data integration type work to help people have access to the, the data and intel in their businesses so that they can explore and look at their metrics and, uh, and have a better understanding of their business to help make better decisions. So with that, I am going to uh, jump into these questions. I got a lot of them today, so it'll take a little bit of time. We'll probably go a good hour. Anyway, first uh, name submitter is Roland Bernath. I hope I said that right. Okay, question. They ask, do I separate ways and build my own, or is it always this hard to work with family? Okay, business description and background. In our family company, my father is the owner, and I'm supposed to take over the company in a few years. I came to work with him a year ago. On the, si on the side, I have an import-export business, revenue around 500000 U.S., that I believe has potential. Recently, I am realizing he has been very abusing, abusive mo emotionally all my life, but just starting to realize this. I came home to work for him, but it looks at me as any other worker, not respecting my qualities of speaking several languages, having experience in management. He wants to make me do physical work and then tells me I'm lazy when I tell him that this is not what I'm here for. Long term, I see big potential in our family business, building up logistics, e-commerce, etc. But right now, we are at um, odds fighting because he's trying to micromanage everything, me as well. Many times I'm feeling I'm wasting my time and potential here. My energy, my mental energy is draining, but I am the oldest son in the family and was pretty much programmed. That is my responsibility to take over the company. I do feel emotionally attached, but I feel like I am destined for bigger things in life. So, Roland, I'll say to that that you have the curse, the curse of entrepreneurialism, which means that you are not employable. Okay, um, just like myself, I am not employable. I cannot work for somebody else. Somebody else would fire me because I would uh, not follow the rules, not play by the typical aspects of, of the flow, and it would get me in trouble. But uh, that's what we do as entrepreneurs. We go out and, and break break the rules, break into different opportunities, and try to help the world be a better place with, the, uh, with our eyes looking to explore and expand on things that uh, can make the world a better place. So... Uh, I would say that there's a lot of details here that I would need to know about that would help to answer this question, but really, I don't have the answers here. You do, and the answers are inside you, so it's a matter of digesting some of the things that you have talked about and looking at it in a way that could take a little bit of the emotion out and add some rationalization to you, and that can be done in some type of... Uh, you know, what some people call um, peaceful thinking or some people call meditation. I would do some, I'd look at it as like getting quiet and peaceful and taking deep breaths. You can do that with like six to uh, six breaths in, six breaths out, or so hold the six 
and then let out to six and maybe do that like five or six times and sit peacefully and contemplate. With that, you're going to be able to uh, start over a period of time. It's not going to happen the first time, but if you do that, you're going to have more intel come to you and that heart-mind connection will occur so that you can make better decisions. So this is a tough one. Um, it's um, I'm not going to say one or the other because that it's just too many things here. You're talking about family, and that becomes too personal, and a lot of long-term implications are are being looked at here. But like I said in the beginning, you're an entrepreneur, so there's maybe an opportunity for um, you doing your own thing for a while, learning and growing, and then coming back into business. That happens a lot in family businesses, and key person goes out that key person that the business should evolve to or uh, be, be handed down to and they leave and go out and explore a little bit in the world gain some insight knowledge other work under other people and other systems and come back to that in a better uh, in a better way so um, hopefully that that'll help you some if uh, if not email me and we can maybe talk some more with some more details next question uh you guys names on here they're always tough for dyslexic so uh i'll do my best um bob jiggerier it looks like asked the question how much of being successful in business is winning the game against yourself business description and background question for a mastery of online poker back in the day i realized that the key to success was to win the game against myself controlling my emotions Avoiding temptation and deep thought on new information was the secret sauce. As I've begun the Maximize Your Mindset course, it seems like poker and business could be similar in this sense. Thoughts. Elevator Pitch, over the past two years, developed a skincare managed product and I'm looking to build a brand and company around it. Okay, Bob. Um, you Yes, you are right. And in fact, it is most of it in that uh, winning the game is really against yourself. Your, our own self-imposed limitations are our problem. They hold us back the most, not other people, but we tend to blame other people. And oh, they, hold us back, they hold us back because we impose a certain level or ceiling on ourselves. And at times, it would, breaking through that ceiling and reaching new heights is really hard to do because we self-sabotage and we, we do the things that bring us back to a level that we think that we're supposed to be at. So one way to break through that, and I've, I've run into that you know, at different times in my life, and even not, you know, not that recent past, even though I've had a lot of success in my life. And when I did, what I, I was working with a coach, and with that I came to, he told me about writing in a journal. Being dyslexic, writing and writing things down was never a strength of mine, and I would. Uh, but I started to do it, and what I did was I I did a daily journal where I would talk about the things I was grateful for. When you are in a grateful mode, you are not you're taking yourself away from uh, limitations and so forth, and opening yourself up to abundance. So gratefulness is huge, and you can be thankful for so many things. You can be thankful for the beauty of the day. You can be thankful for um, for the the places you are, the people you meet, the people that change your life. You can be uh, thankful for um, the, what you currently have right now and also being thankful for what's to come. So thankful for your health, thankful for a lot, uh, just uh, you name it, cross the board, there's a lot to be thankful for. And when you practice that, you open yourself up. I know that it, um, when people talk to me in the past about being grateful, I was very, you know, kind of skeptical. About, okay, yeah, I'm grateful. I'm a grateful person, yes, you know thank God and thank the universe or are thankful for what is in front of me. But I did not practice in a sense that you're trying to open up a, a new stream of connection to the, uh, the, to what you vibrate out there is what you attract to you. So when you're very grateful, you're going to attract the potential to a lot of abundance. Hope that helped Bob. Okay. Kelly Killingsworth. Thanks Kelly for the, easier name question what is the professional way to answer a client who asks to receive a specific itemized quote after you have given them the bid for the job 
business background, description and background of question. I own a small construction company that specializes in fences, decks, roofs, and small interior renovations. I put a bid on a garage remodel where I contracted the electrical part of it out. I added 20% on the electrical bid, not sure if that's kosher, plus my materials and my time. After giving my bid, the client then asked for an itemized quote. So, Kelly, yes, it's, I think it's very appropriate for them to ask for itemize, but it's also very appropriate for you as being the contractor to engage subcontractors and you make money from that work that you're doing as part of the overall project. Now, how you disclose this and, and how you work with it is up to you. My son is a contractor and my son works to build things. He brings in the subs and with that, he's uh, he's bringing the money and it's a lot of times around 15 to 20 percent so it's appropriate so and and itemizing everything out i itemize the materials that you have in there i'd itemize the um uh the labor that you're putting into it if any and uh and the electrical now electrical you don't have to say you marked it up 20 percent. you could say electrical materials are x and electrical labor is y and your 20 percent is built into that so it's um, it's very appropriate to do a some type of itemization because as a business owner that has asked for services and times I, I hear things that says uh, doesn't make sense to me let me see it when I see it broken down I get it it adds up to a number that I really wasn't thinking about so that's what your client is doing here and you providing that opportunity for them um, but the, uh, also for their expectation that you're going to make money on this so you can disclose that in whatever way you feel is best but a lot of times um, in this space, the client will say um, all materials and, and labor that I bring to the table and I add 20% to that and they you add, add all the materials, all the different subcontractors labor and then you put 20% on top of that. Or you just put in, this is the price uh, electric, this is the price for the AC unit, this is the price for the plumbing and on that percentage gets added in to, to a the total amount that you want to charge which will include your percentage so there's also lots of software out there for invoicing and bidding that people are not using and um, I would highly recommend that in fact I've been pushing my son he's not using it right now I've been pushing him to use it so uh, that will help you in, in speeding up the process for quotes a lot of this work that you do is quoting business and spending the time to do a quote for somebody and if you can streamline that process as efficiently as possible then that's going to help you uh, to uh, scale a little bit more so i don't have any suggestions but i i would google them and look it up and see what you come up with i hope that helps okay next question is by heather brockman heather Heather asked, is there an average training period I should be working towards with my new hires? Business description and background question. We currently have our on-the-job training set at 80 hours to cover all aspects of the company. The processes, the vehicles, and this is all followed by a test to make sure they understand and can implement everything. It is paid training, of course, but the groomers who are used to making commissions it is a dramatic change, $100 a day for paid training. This may have a cost. This may have cost me a new hire. I'm now wondering, do I keep the training uh, thorough and mandatory, 80 hours, or do I, or is this the same across the board, or do I tweak it for each person? Elevator pitch. We offer high-end, holistic grooming experience for busy pet owners and whose animals are part of the family. Okay, Heather, uh, really good question, and in that one, impressive about your training. Okay, you having the training and a process in place are the quality good companies. They do this type of setup to provide consistency and the ability for their client, their their employees, to learn how to best integrate with their clients, go through the processes for safety, for other measures that pr prevent accidents mistakes and problems for everybody so having that in place is is awesome so what do you do about something like this uh well there's some different options okay um i would uh, uh 
maybe you separate out new hires with inexperienced hire or hires okay inexperienced in your field okay if somebody's coming from a different pet grooming business and they are experienced maybe you want to treat them a little bit differently or slowly integrate them if possible with the training process so they can make some money or another way to do it is that say maybe after 90 days of them being on the job working to create value that you will um, bonus them some of those tips that they lost in the beginning to attract that new hire okay so there's some different ways you can finagle this and maybe that you don't pay it all out in 90 days maybe you pay it out over time to help incentivize that person to stay on board that you know the average amount of tips per day could be about this number and over that training period they could you could do that to incentivize the good people so you don't lose options um, inexperienced people need to go through the process of learning and growing and so forth and that's just part of their education and you're paying them for that so there's no issues from my from the way I would look at it and uh, yeah I think that's about all I have on that so you know they think about it there's different ways to explore the payout process and be creative with it you can uh, do it where you pay chunks it's almost like vesting if you're familiar with retirement plans investing if you stay with a company one year you get 20 percent two years you get 40 percent three years 60 and on up to a lot of times five years you get 100 percent. so it means you have to stay with a company to get the money that they put in a retirement plan for you up to like say five years here is that you stay with me for a period of time and i will pay you those lost commissions that you have because they're working to be productive and make you money and so on and so forth and actually knowing the numbers and that data that that each groomer is doing how they're producing and so forth is helpful for you so if you're keeping track of that that's going to be advantageous to tell you how much per, that each person is making and and then potentially the satisfaction that they're getting from your from your uh, customers next question Allison um, Allison's last name is Ko Koya Ng, I think so I'm sure I didn't do that one Allison here's um, Allison's question is how do you deal with employees lying to you business description and background of question uh, it's another question my other ones wasn't wasn't hasn't answered yet Hope that this is okay. So I guess she answered another question in a previous program. So Allison, um, marketing agency, yesterday I found out that someone that works for me has been lying about the work she's been doing and using the company time to do an other work that has nothing to do with the task I assigned her. She also went against the confidentiality agreement she signed by using te techniques and strategies I taught her for our agency's work for other um our agency's work for other work she's been doing and lying about wondering how you dealt with this situation like this before and how I should approach the situation thank you for time and um, expertise okay well it's actually pretty simple for me okay I've had problem situations in the past I've had uh, employees that were working for me and expected to get projects done that were out um, contracting separate project and doing those on the time that they were supposed to be working for me okay to me it's inexcusable and they will be let go under my roof so I put up with the lying you know lying is is relative in a lot of sense lying a little white lie to protect somebody's feelings or is this out and out lying that's breaking down um, a relationship and the approaches that you're trying to do of run a, a company and the culture that you're building and in this situation it looks like a lot of what you said is um, very extreme and I wouldn't put up with it so you handle it the way you think is best but in my experience if you have somebody that is at is working at that ethical type of level they're going to cause more damage in the future and they shouldn't be um, around or continue to be in an environment that then cause more damage to you thanks Allison okay so next question is by Lindsay uh, Lannanen questions they asked how do you sell a dispute over two employees that don't like each other business description and background a question I own a chocolate business 
However, my dispute is with an employee where I work. I've already gone to my manager and nothing has really been done. I want to know what the most professional way is to approach the situation. Elevator pitch, I sell chocolates with ingredients collected from direct trade farms in sustainable sourced packaging. Okay, Lindsay. Uh, a lot of this stuff, and I've been in office environments, I've, I'm, most of the time I, they've been my offices because the companies I run. In my beginning of my career, we rented office space, my partner and I, when we started an investment firm from other people, and I saw the office politics and the get along, you know, people trying to get along and not get along and so on. And I had my employees with the problems of get, not getting along. And I would say to you that since this is in another job where you are an employee that usually a lot of time is just misunderstanding and communication issues so being the bigger person trying to take deep breaths and get some of the emotion out of the way i would just talk to this person you know hey it looks like you're that i've i've uh, you know something here is going on between us and i don't know if you're irritated i don't know if you're uncomfortable but i really like to know if there's something that I've done that offends you or is a problem and at least help me to understand so that we can uh, work together. Going about it that way can a lot of times open up a discussion that will allow you to hear and listen to somebody and try to be empathetic, okay? Like trying to put yourself in that person's shoes and when you hear things from that person's perspective and you relate to where that person's coming from, it, it allows for the engagement to work. I've been working with Eric Maddox. Eric is the guy who caught Saddam Hussein. And so he was, he did it through empathetic listening, not some type of torture program, but he did it by engaging what was the enemy to try to tell him where certain people were to, that would lead to one person that would lead to the next that can get him down the path of leading to Saddam Hussein. And he used empathetic listening. And there's there's techniques and tactics to it, but really it's just trying. Uh, the basis of it is is trying to understand where that person's coming from from their side. So um, tell them you can tell them what you're, you're wanting to know and look at it from their side and their environment to see what's going. A lot of times, you know, it's not even you; um, it's something else, and somehow they're taking out on you, or somehow it's it's being reflected in a way that it's assumptions. We all make assumptions, we all look at our our own issues and we project that out to the world and, and we think everybody sees that and a lot of times they don't. Completely, uh, can be a complete misunderstanding. So here in, in office world and people and dealing with people and people are your biggest asset, people are your biggest um, uh, source of problems in business. And you want good people, you want to build a culture of good people, and there's a lot of work that goes into that. But when you have people problems, it, it's definitely stressful and straining and just asking the prayer. I bring people into my office and say, hey, what's going on here? What do you, you know, why, why is there such a problem? Why you don't, why are you not getting along with this person? And I would try to understand. And I found out a lot of times, the one person who thought it was mad, it was, it was completely because of some other weird, strange, different issue. So give that a try, and hopefully that'll help. Okay, next question is also from another Lindsay. It's Lindsay uh, Grifka. Question, how can I get the attention of the buyer after I receive their personal email or a purchasing team email from a cold call to the dispensary? So... The business background and, and of question is, I have been calling dispensaries and have been putting and getting personal emails um, or buying team emails from the bud tender. I'm currently writing an email to them. As soon as I hang up, it reads, hi, name of potential person. I just spoke with uh, bud tender's name about my new line of cannabis storage accessories and grinders that are really taking off. He or she recommended I email you to schedule a call. When are you free to chat a bit more about my innovative line? The subject is either bling blunts at dispensary name or hey person's name. I sometimes include pictures of bestsellers and other times I do not. I haven't received any emails back yet, but I've started this yesterday, so I'm being patient. All of the dispensaries have already received three emails prior to my calls 
and with an intro into the brand but basically those emails uh, went to general inbox thank you Lindsay elevator pitch at bling blunts we break stereotypes and promote self-expression and confidence by offering innovative and chic personal storage containers that are high fashion functional and discreet so our can a farm can enjoy at can a farm can enjoy themselves to the fullest without critique or judgment try our smell resistant airtight childproof and reusable containers today probably should have read the elevator pitch to maybe make that make a little bit more con context to you the uh the business description okay so my thoughts on this um first of all the email that you're sending is all about you and a key very very key point in business is to realize that your customers do not care about you straight up they don't they don't give a shit okay what can you do for them or what kind of value can you provide them so let me give you a quick example so my software company is called Efficiency, and, and if I send out an email to somebody or to you, okay, Lindsay, I'm sending you an email. What are you doing? You're working your company. Maybe you know you've got some things, need some, some software services. So I send an email and say, "Hi, Lindsay, this is Greg at Efficiency, and we do custom software applications, build mobile apps, e-commerce apps, and so on and so forth. And if there's anything I can help you with, let me know because we can." Uh, we are a great software company and we've been in business for 15 plus years and we have a great team. Okay. What did I just do? I just sent out something that talked all about me. You don't, you don't care. So if I said something like this instead, um, I actually was recently putting together something that I wanted to kind of do a little social media around. Um, in four is a lar is a ERP system. And we've done integration work with e, um, with this N4 SX ERP system where we built integration pieces to help get people online because the main system doesn't allow for uh, direct access to customers. So if I said um, N4 users, are you having a problem with getting your uh getting your customers online to buy your products and dealing with a lot of difficulties with your salespeople having to come back and place the actual orders instead of the customers doing it for themselves. So you see there, I presented a problem to my potential clients that they may be having. And if they resonate with that problem, they are more apt to wake up to what they're seeing, uh, get more excited about it and respond to it because, Hey, this person is solving my problem. I am going to, um, I am going to go after and and want to work with somebody like that because they're. I'm going to respond to them, email them back because I think they may be able to help me create value for me. So I want to talk to them. Okay. So your like I said, your email. How can you position that email to them that is solving their problem? What is their problem? and if they're not having a problem it makes it a little more difficult but if they're if they're having a problem of not having um, containers that are functional and useful to them and they have problems with them and they break and other things then present that problem hey customer are you having difficulty with taking care of your cannabis in a way that provides for uh, secure and longevity and storage and other types of things if so, we have products that can help you. Okay, just a different way to look at it. And it's and actually for anybody on here, anybody listening to this, that if you present your business in solving other people's problems, approach and way and vocabulary or using the, the right words and, and, and that speak to that person, you're going to have a much better opportunity to create business. Okay, name is Jake uh, Carlisle, and Jake says, how do I make big-time connections without feeling insecure? Business description and background of question, I feel like I, I would not belong with the big boys, at least not yet, because I haven't done much. I feel they wouldn't take me seriously, real estate, in parentheses. So, let's see, Jake, this applies to the early point I made about our self-imposed limitations. You are placing a self-imposed limitation on yourself, and 
doing some of that work with maybe journaling and or taking some time to be grateful about all that you've accomplished so far, what you do for the world, how you help your customers, how you have created value for them, and do that in a way that allows you to build up your value that you can create uh, relationships with bigger players in the marketplace, okay? Uh, it, it may not happen right away. We, sometimes we just got a pair of dues. We've got to work. I started out early. Um, I was in college actually, and I got into I got an internship with an insurance company, and I was out doing insurance and financial planning for people, and I was out doing minuscule stuff, and I wanted to be like the big guys in the office that were selling million dollar policies and other things like that. But it just comes with a little bit of uh, time and experience to get you to that place, and for people to to see you maybe a little bit differently. But that doesn't mean you can't do more now to help open up and not have these self-imposed limitations and know that you're worthy and valuable and provide some type of um, approach, like I was saying, to allow that to build. And as that builds and you get more confidence, you do more deals and so on, you'll reach that level of people. Okay. And what I found, you know, I grew up very... Uh, you know, low income. I actually looked through, uh, lived in a trailer at one point in my life and my parents got divorced and it was the one option that my mother had for us and we had to do that for a few years. And it wasn't who we were, but it was part of the, um, the life that we, the cars that we were dealt at the time. And you know what? I went through life at times thinking that maybe I'm not good enough and so forth and I can't be like them and I can't have the money as them. Those were the self-imposed limitations that I have to take on for myself and I had to grow through them. So it's just a matter of doing some of this work, continuing to have that self-improvement type of personal, personal um, growth and self-improvement type of mindset and read things that can help you in that area and to do uh, a little bit of this abundance thinking with a lot of gratitude. Next question is Mark McDowell. Mark asked, asked the question, how important are business cards today and what things should I be sure to include and is, a, is the design that important? Background question, I'm looking to update my business card. Currently I have a templated type card. I like it, but I want something different. Are business cards really as important of a tool as they used to be? What kind of things can I include on the card to really make them stand out? And is the investment worth it? Elevator pitch, commercial and personal insurance. Focus is mostly on small to medium sized businesses. Okay, Mark, um, good question for you, especially because of the world that you're in. But as far as cards themselves, I do not feel that they're that important in the sense that I don't carry a card with me anymore. Sometimes I may have a card somewhere and I can pull one out in an easier way to, to give um, some contact information on the, on the fly. But for the most part, we're all carry phones now. So if you're connecting with somebody, getting, and you want to potentially do work with them, getting their email. Hey, let me email you something. If you're having that conversation and they express a little bit of interest, hey, let me email you over a uh, something that can help you in your and, and with your business in the form of protecting you guys. And, you know, and also I'm doing this, uh, I do a, a blog or my company sends out updates about how to make sure you're protected and secure in certain areas, whether it's your, uh, your, your, your life or your disability and protecting that income for your family and so to speak. So there's a lot of things that you can be doing in, in that space that will present a, um, a way to look at who you are without it being a car, just a car. Now, okay, so if you have a card, you want to make a card, I'd make it, I'd make it decent. You don't put a lot of money into it, but make it decent. Also, put something into that card that um, stimulates a question. Like, okay, I do commercial and personal insurance. Well, so do, does you know, so many other people. So what's different about you? What do you do? What is the value that you bring to the table? And if you look at it in a sense of, I provide security. I helped protect your family when you can't. Something like that. I mean, I'm just going on the fly here. But if you put a little thought into that, into 
what you would say on your card, I would write down something that, and, and put in there that tells people what you do in a way that is more appropriate to just say I provide insurance. Okay, more appropriate, I mean more creative, more thoughtful into what you're actually doing for them. What is the value that you're providing for them? So, and everybody should be looking at that. If you have a card or what you have on your website, it's about who you are and what you're providing them and not just saying, I do this, I do that. Okay, so give that a try. Look at, uh, you know, cards are, uh, right now, I think, Somebody gives me a card, it's just going to go into the landfill. I'll write down, if I needed that name or, or email address, phone number or email address, I would just take it and then I'm tossing the card away. It's not something I'm going to keep around. So I have a stack of cards from way back that I thought at some point if I ever needed to go back and track down some people or I remember somebody from way back that I don't communicate with, I may go back and try to get some cards. But most of the time I just throw them away because I get their information. I don't need the card for anything anymore. So as somebody doing insurance, you may be out marketing, you may be at networking events, you may be talking to people, you want to say, yeah, I do insurance, but express it in a way that gives them more um, of a connection to what you're really doing, okay? Okay, next question comes from another unique name, um, Yolindi D. Govani, Govana, I think. Uh, so, question from Yolindi is, best way to raise capital during the early stages of your business? Business description and background of question. We produce and sell decorative pillow covers. We want to expand by manufacturing pillow inserts. We resell inserts at the moment, and it's about 50% of our income monthly. Making these ourselves will drive our cost down to a third of the current cost and save on shipping uh, to us. This will give us a very competitive advantage on our Amazon and Walmart marketplaces. Purchasing the equipment and raw stock will be around 90000 with a retail value of 700000 That's a lot of opportunity. So it will leave a lot of room for us to offer wholesale pricing. We will be the only manufacturer in the valley with which is a huge market advantage. Who do I approach? Venture capitalists, angel investors, private investors. I have my business plan, projections, last two years financials, business assets all ready to go. Elevator pitch. We're a mother and daughter team that, that designs and creates custom decorative throw pillows for home and business branding. Okay. Very interesting. You look like you're in a, an attractive situation. Um, a couple things I don't know about it, uh, from reading this is that what level of income are you and what level could you handle um, currently and what level could you handle some potential debt. So being in investment world, we looked at things as what is the cost of capital to somebody. Okay, cost of capital is what, what are you paying out and equity is always the most expensive form of of capital and it has a lot of potential it can be very beneficial to give equity because at, at times it's not worth it's worth little when in the beginning of your business to creating a lot of value later on so in this situation you have a marketplace you are selling to people you are making money you have customers with all that factored in you could go out and figure out how to borrow this money to get access to it to start making the money because the return is multiple you know it's seven times your money so can you use credit cards do you have a home equity loan do you have uh, access to uh, some friends that will loan you money some family that will loan you money and giving them a very retractive turn right now if you told somebody that you would give them a 10 percent return on money that they loaned you and put up some collateral, which is the equipment that you're buying for the debt, you, uh, you would be talking to people that I would, I would be interested, okay? Uh, because you're providing a very attractive return, but it's not giving away a whole lot. It's not giving away, if you didn't have a lot of confidence in yourself and you didn't have a lot of money and you weren't making money, then the equity thing would be more of something to look at. But since you've gotten down such a path 
I would first considering debt before you start giving your money away. Venture capital is something that you don't really need to get caught up with because they're just too demanding and they're looking for a quick turnaround. They'd want to get out of your business in five years. Okay, angel investor would be potential, somebody that could come in and give you some money. They're going to want to return, but they, um, may, they may have a longer time horizon. So angel is somebody that comes in and helps you uh, to um, usually when you're in trouble. So they're, the, they're called angels that come in to save you. And in this situation, you don't need an angel. You need just access to some capital. And to getting that capital in the most cost-efficient way is ultimately what you would want to accomplish here. And for and, and first place to start out with debt. Okay, so do you have a bad credit record and so forth? Well, if that's the case, um, look at using some of the equipment you would be buying as collateral to get other people to loan you the money. Okay, I would. Um, it, it, you're in a attractive situation. I would like to know more about it. If you wanted to email me, Greg at efficient.us, and talk to me about your other numbers, I could maybe provide a little bit more insight as to what are some other options about this and we can get creative when I know more about your situation. Okay, next question is Michael Wildling. Thanks Michael for the uh, simple and easy to read name. Questions uh, that he asked is, so from an ask, believe, receive in quotes, prayer perspective, let's say I want to deal I want a deal to go through and I'm concerned may not at the end of a meeting. That I'm concerned may not at the end of the meeting go through is what he's saying. Do I specific do I specifically for the deal to go my way and then just believe and say that the deal went my way? Or, I'm sorry, do I ask specifically for the deal to go my way and then just believe say the deal went my way? Example, um, ask, please have my one customer buy a hundred thousand of merchandise this week believe and say i'm so happy and grateful now that my one customer has bought ten thousand of merchandise this week what you're saying there is um relative to the some of the things i've said in this uh, in this conversation um previously okay so a couple things about it to put it put this right in in context is that you cannot control other people you can put things out into the universe and that you are resonating and look to attract people of that same type of vibrational frequency. You're, you're vibrating at this frequency and you're trying to find people that come in at the same frequency. If they're up here or down here or whatever, it's not, it's not like one's better or the other, just different frequencies. Okay. So it's like, you know, you tune into mm, 93.1 and you get smooth jazz. You turn into 97.5, you get hard rock. They're just two different frequencies. And what you're getting from those frequencies are different things. So what is it that you're putting out? Well, to do this, you have to align. Just saying something is and, and putting out like a general statement that is a mantra or something that you're trying to create in the world if, if you're just saying it and you don't connect your heart and with your mind and with what you're saying it's not going to happen you're not going to vibrate at the right frequency to make it happen so working in this space you would want to do what you're saying okay but you don't want to like look at it as forcing something specifically like um you could say something in the form of, uh, I am, I am wanting, uh, not wanting, but, uh, I am looking to sell $10,000 of merchandise. Um, my business's growth is, is going to benefit with $10,000 of merchandise sales and selling $10,000 to the world is, is a, uh, is beneficial and valuable because of whatever. Okay, so and you got to get to have more heart connection and mind connection. I'm not relating it to your situation as much as I would if it was mine. But in this, you got to feel the two coming together if you're going to make something like that uh, actually work for you. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Michael. Okay. Next question is Robin Turbin. Hi, Robin. I've answered some of your questions before. Question, when starting a business, do you think it is necessary to have a social media presence? Thank you. 
business description and background of question and in person interactions are more comfortable for me elevator pitch as an artist i help people feel moments of calm moments of calm through my oil, oil paintings of sunsets well that's beautiful robin that, that is um um i'd love to see some of your work so in regard to what you're asking uh a couple questions do you sell your paintings online okay if you're selling your paintings online which is a huge positive because you're opening yourself up to a marketplace that is not local and is not a network of friends and family but and not just a, a, a local store where the proximity of people to that store are going to be your customers but it opens up to the whole world okay you could have beautiful sunsets and you could resonate with the message that you put out with your paintings that could attract people from anywhere in the world to buy them and so do you so your question is um can i start a business and not have to use social media well if you're selling online you want to use the benefits of social media okay so i I'm not really sure where your hesitation is relative to using social media and that you're more comfortable with doing like one-on-one -on -one or personal interactions. So I look at this and say, if you have an online presence, you have a website that's, it, that is a commerce e-commerce store that you can sell your paintings and you showcase your paintings on there, then what you could do is you could market them on Instagram. Instagram would be great for for this okay and showing your paintings and creating some type of like tagline to them like and that's just going to come from you and you and your heart is really what you need you don't have to put a lot of mumbo jumbo out there that is not uh, resonating with you you don't have to write long blogs about your business but what you can do is just put things out there that interacts with the world that more and more people could see and spread so if you did a sunset for example and you were inspired by that sunset and it was like say I was walking for, across the Golden Gate Bridge and I saw this beauty and I painted the sunset because it was I was inspired by my walk across the Golden Gate Bridge people are going to connect to that in a certain way some people will and those that will that are feeling the um, that interaction they would maybe be attracted to two years uh, to your particular painting and then they would want to they potentially would want to um, push that forward and send it to other people so that they could be exposed to your painting and to your work so yes using social media is very important in today's world now when you say like writing long complicated posts about you or who you are or how great you are or what a great artist you are is not that relevant as it is just putting your stuff out there and allowing a, a, a short sweet message that gives the what inspired you to do that painting i'm talking directly to this but to everybody out there it's like what are the things that you're doing and you're providing to the world and what caused this connection what was this mind heart connection that i was talking about before that allow for you to um to you to do this work and the why you created it and just something could be done short or it can be more descriptive you can put a paragraph into it i I saw this sunset when I was on uh, the, one of the Caribbean islands, we'll say St. John, and I was there at a beach and I saw this great sunset and I was on vacation or I was on my honeymoon and just some things around those comments about what inspired you to do that painting is when people are going to connect to that in certain ways. And when they do, they're more apt to be connected to you and your work and want to spend money with you. So I, I think it's important that you have it. It can just be structured in a way that works best for you. You don't have to do like, okay, well, I've been told if I'm with social media, I got to write a blog or I got to do a lot of video stuff or I got to do this. I got to do that. You know, if you have beautiful paintings, having a picture of them and putting them out in a, a place, whether it's Facebook or Instagram is going to be very easy for you to do. And it's just going to showcase who you are and what you're doing. Okay, and maybe if you have, if you're comfortable, you can have somebody videotape you painting and they could, you could be doing your work and you're not saying anything. You're just like doing it and then maybe there's some music in the background on it and, and a lot of that stuff's easy to do. And maybe there's some um, writing across the bottom of the screen saying, here is Robin 
um, in her studio doing uh, her, her in deep into doing her best work. Okay, so just it's it's um, it's not that hard. Uh, don't look at it as um, uh, locking yourself into one area, but do what works for you. Most importantly, do what feels right to you when you do social media. Next question. Uh, Rohit Gupta. Rohit says, I have a business idea and done some research. Now I'm not sure which direction to go into. Business description and background. I'm thinking of designing the glove as I have done research to cover the basics, but not sure if they're if this is my next step, not sure what is my next step, I think he's trying to say. Uh, okay, so, well, you haven't put a lot of info here, okay, for me to help you. But I'll take a stab at a few things that is general and may help other people. So, you talk about designing a glove, okay? If you're just going to create a glove, what's the value of the glove or what's the uniqueness of that glove? Like we said before in the previous marketing stuff, what is the problem that you're solving with that glove? Is this glove waterproof? Is this glove warm your hand and below zero? What is it that is going to make this glove more attractive to other people? Is this glove design more designer and prettier than other gloves? So you got to look at it from that perspective, why you want to make it, and then just say, I'm going to make something. If you're going to make a glove, what is got to, you got to create some uniqueness out there in the world for people to be attracted to you. So getting the, starting with that in mind, the end in mind being what is my best thing that I'm going to do that's going to fit into this small little niche that nobody else is doing. When you can do that, you're going to have the opportunity to open doors to uh, attract people to what you're doing and them spending money with you. So, uh, you know, if you just do a quick search, Google search around um, invention, inventor, uh, like uh, help with inventing a product, there's a company, uh, there's a group out there called inventorhelp.com. Okay, inventhelp.com, I think it is. And they will um, allow people to understand how to do patents, how to do other things. They'll take a percentage of your deal, but they can put a lot of the resources and processes in place. Another way to look at this, I mean, if you're designing something, you're going to have to have some type of prototype. And you would maybe want to do some, you want to get connected with some engineers or some people that have done prototypes. You can search for some companies that maybe do that in your area, or you could put like a Facebook message out saying, hey, I'm trying to design something. Does anybody know a company that will build a, um, some type of prototype for me? Okay, or design it from a clothing perspective. I mean, design a piece of cloth that's going to be representative of your of what you're trying the glove you're trying to make and what its uniqueness is what is it what's the material that's going to be on the glove that could be more attractive than other gloves um, they're not as slippery gloves or in the sense today right we all got our phones my gloves allow you to use your phone because i was just out skiing a few weeks ago and i had to pull off my glove having to do my phone um you know respond to a message or something like that and having a glove that allows you to touch your screen is um, is something that I've seen a few gloves do. I don't think there's that many in the marketplace, but I would I would look at something like that. Also, you may want to sign an NDA. I mean, you have people sign an NDA, which is NDA stands for Non Disclosure Agreement. I would just type in NDA into Google. There's plenty of generic forms out there, and when you present this to somebody before you talk to them about your idea, you got to make sure they're not going to steal your idea, and you got to make sure that they um, are are not going to be able to resell it or do something along similar similar lines uh, down the down the road. So. Reading through uh, an NDA is usually pretty commonsensical. You just, you know, hey, this is my idea, and you don't have any rights to use it or sell it or provide it to anybody for a period of time or forever, whatever you may feel most comfortable with, um, and so on. Yeah, and so using like Facebook or LinkedIn or other sources to be able to share that or find the people that you're looking for that can help you is always the positives of the network community that we live in today. Okay, last question for the day is Christopher Joseph. Christopher asks, 
Is a pre-launch strategy recommended for a software product still in development? And do you have any tips, resources to better learn how to create a proper pre-launch strategy? Business description and background of question. I'm currently in alpha testing with a small group of targeted customers for my software tool for content creators and streamers. It was recommended to my by my CTO to do a pre-launch to build hype, continue gauging interest, and expand our email list. She says, we could do this pre-launch before the product is finalized. We are thinking along the lines of a coming soon landing page with and uh, enter your email to stay in, in the know. I would like to know your thoughts on how and when a pre-launch strategy should be executed. Thank you in advance. Absolutely. Okay. Pre-launch um, is getting things out in the marketplace as soon as possible and creating awareness about it as soon as possible is always an advantageous thing to do so smart uh, recommendation by your CTO now how you go about it you said you're in uh, alpha alpha is you know pre beta so beta means you got your product ready to go but I don't know if you're if you're utilizing alpha in the same terms as beta but alpha testing usually means that you're testing it through your company and you got a few people working on it that to make sure that you got a lot of kinks out beta users are more of does this flow correctly for the business process that we're solving or how they're using this so I'd say that just as you get ready to launch this in beta with more customers and the appropriate customers and you're getting it out in that world this would be a great way to spread the message of who you are to get access to more people build up that list like you're talking about and do so in a way that's gonna um, that's gonna allow attract more customers and finally and when you when you fully launch a lot of people today when I've talked to them about some of the things different projects and things I've worked on they were like, wow, hey, I'll test that for you when you're ready to go. That's really interesting to me. I want to be a part of that. And so if what you're doing is unique and different and in this world, if you can get that message out and if you can um, have other people share it for you or you can get some people to write up some stuff on it and talk about it in the respective chat rooms or other places, then you will direct people to you because when the new and different stuff is coming, that always piques people's interest. And they're going to want to say, yeah, hey, I want to know more about that. And very people are very willing to throw their email up to allow you to have access to a potential customer when they know that it's new and different and it's coming out soon and they want to be part of the, the new thing. You know, I just think about psychology. It's like um, we, we look at people standing in line for the next phone years. Not so much today, I don't think, but years ago when the new iPhones or the new whatever was coming out, there would be people camped for days waiting for that new piece because they wanted to be the first one to be there. So that same similar type of psychology is applicable to this. People want to be exposed to this first. They want to be, there's that smaller segment of the population that wants to be ahead of the game, ahead of the, 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 the what's coming and what's popular and uh, they want to be in the know so they're more apt to be more aggressive in communicating connecting with you at this stage so definitely would put it out there if, if you said you're alpha testing and if you are that means you got you got targeted customers in it already I would consider that beta testing and I would think that you'd be ready to go right now as far as getting that page up and, and then attracting more beta users which Will, will lead to customers that will tell the story for you to other potential customers. So start that network flow and that aspect of connecting to the world and share your message with people. Don't uh, don't hesitate at all. It's it's very positive. Thanks for your question, Christopher. And with that, I am done for today's questions. Look forward to seeing you guys all again next or talking to you again uh, next month and and answering your questions. Uh, I love doing this. I love sharing. I uh, I think it um, today it it's it flows easier for me. I like to uh, I like to share stuff. I actually would rather be talking to people one on one and being able to ask them questions that I can really dig in and, and, and drill down to a level that I think I can go a lot deeper with people to help them with their um, business concerns and so forth. But hopefully that you guys got some value today and look forward to talking to you next time. So to AO community, keep kicking and, and pushing and driving and doing everything you can because your success is going to come because of you. So go out and make it happen. Upward and onward. Take care all. Bye.